Good evening, everyone. Uh, 11.45 p.m. on this, the 12th day of June. So it's almost uh, the 13th. And as all my regular viewers know, all two or three of you, to my miserable and pathetic little YouTube channel, uh, Candy the Wonder Pop always makes an appearance. Had her for now three and a half years. She came into the house on Join the Family March 18th of 2020. Should have named, as I've said many times, we should have named her Corona or COVID. And I was bad. I did not get her treat ready. So I don't have a treat in hand. So I need to get up and go get her her treat. Otherwise, I get... Otherwise, I get no peace. So here, here we go. So we'll do the standard. He's a smart dog. I should teach her more tricks. Uh, give me five. Lay down. Speak. Good. Come up. There you go. That is to the treat is to buy me peace. Uh, again, thank you for watching. Uh, welcome. Uh, talking about climate change, the big, the the big bad boogeyman of climate change. Um, back on April thirtieth of this year, so just a month and a bit ago, I did a video uh, making three predictions, and the first of those three predictions that we will see the declaration of a climate emergency, or words very close to that, uh, this summer. In the summer of 2023, I am predicting, and I'm not the only one, and I'm sure I'm not even the first one to make this prediction, but we are going to see the declaration of a climate emergency. Uh, in that video, I, I believe the one from April 30th, it's linked down below. Uh, I believe that I was speaking about it in the context of a global climate emergency, and I still see that as the most likely outcome. However, I also will allow that it might be a unilateral declaration for by Canada's Prime Minister Trudeau or by U.S. President Joe Biden or globally, but I think we're going to see a declaration. And... At the time that I made that prediction, uh, at that point, the, the wildfire situation in Canada had not blown up. And as we all saw last week, I think it was basically Sunday, Monday, Tuesday of last week, things, uh, even in my little corner of southeastern Ontario, and to give you an idea, uh, Toronto, they have what's called the GTA, the Greater Toronto Area. And the eastern edge of that GTA is Oshawa, Ontario. And if you keep going about an hour or so past the eastern edge, that's when you come into my area. Uh, I live basically halfway between Oshawa and Kingston, Ontario, for those who are familiar with the geography of, of, of this area. Uh, but if you're not, I'm about probably two, two, two or so hours outside of Toronto proper. And uh, the, uh, the wildfire situation affected this area. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, you could smell the air, you could taste it. There, you, you, you feel, I shouldn't say it stung the eyes, but it was an irritant. And uh, thankfully, things have cooled down since then. Uh, we had a big rainstorm today, but by Thursday of this past week, the air quality had improved significantly. And so, uh, but the, the wildfires, uh, to me, that is a manufactured crisis. That's not to say that the wildfires were not real. Uh, but I just did a, a friend of mine, Mark, out of, uh, he's in, out of North Carolina, uh, he hosts a podcast called Mark 2.0. I used to do some co-hosting with him on it. And um, 
I just was a guest on the Mark 2.0 con, um, podcast with a friend of mine, Ian, who's an engineer from Mon Montreal, Montreal, Canada, Montreal, Quebec. And we were talking about the wildfire situation. And the thing is, uh, the wildfires that started in Quebec and even the ones that started in northern uh, Alberta, uh, Canada is a cold country, even now. And it's not unusual in northern Quebec, even in Quebec. I lived in Quebec City myself, which is the capital city, and is a little further north than Ottawa. Uh, the uh, you, you still have snow on the ground in May. And Ian brought up the point uh, during this podcast, and I think it's a very important point, is that the ground is still sodden from melting snow. And so it seems highly suspect that fires would start this early in, in the season. And there has been suspicion from a lot of quarters, and I'm not saying they're right or that they're wrong. I'm, uh, I'm merely applauding those who are engaging in critical th thinking and questioning things, that uh, this was orchestrated, that it was... Now, the one thing I had been thinking even prior to the, the, that, why, even prior to thinking about the ground being sodden and everything, I realized that wildfires are something that occur in this country, in Canada, in Alberta, in Quebec, in Ontario, all over. We have wildfires all the time. Uh, my thinking had been that they just either mounted a slow and intentionally slow or an intentionally ineffective response in order to allow these fires to blow up. And CBC News, which is Canada's national government owned media company, uh, CBC ran an article talking about the fact that in Alberta, they used to have rappel teams. You know what rappelling is. It's where you go down on a rope and you can rappel from a helicopter or rappel down a cliff or, and there, if you've been in the military, there are rappelling towers where you learn how to rappel. Uh, at any rate, the Alberta forestry ministry services, they had, a, a, they had rappel teams because often fires will start in an area that's not easily accessible by road or there's no landing strip for an airplane or maybe even a helicopter. So they would go in with a helicopter and fire crews, rapid response teams, would lower in by repelling and then would attack a fire, forest fire before it blew up, before it was able to take a, a firm hold and blow up into something bigger. However, those rappel teams have been canceled and uh, firefighting budgets have been cut going all the way back to 2015. Sounds like a perfect storm and I'm suggesting that it, it was manufactured. I see I've had some people watching. I've, uh, I've had as many as three people on. The chat is open. You're welcome to comment. I always appreciate engagement. I'm going to try and keep this short, but uh, I want to cover some ground tonight. Um, anyway, so we had this big situation. Everyone knows what happens happened. The, the wildfire, the smoke inundated uh, New York City. It affected tens of millions of people in the northeastern portion of the United States. And it... Uh, and of course, the big bad boogeyman of climate change was blamed, you know, to have forest fires in late May, early June. And to this degree is unprecedented, unheard of. And they blew up, they grew to such a significant extent that tens of millions of people were affected. And uh, in the wake of those fires, President Joe Biden and you can check into this. I haven't linked any articles for it, but there have been articles in the Washington Post uh, speaking to the fact that uh, what I'll call the champions of the so-called progressive left, so-called progressives, are urging or calling upon U.S. President Joe Biden to declare a climate emergency, which would open up to him all manner of executive powers and authority. 
uh, individuals like uh, um, Bernie Sanders, individuals like Elizabeth Warren, again, the champions of the so-called progressives are screaming at Biden to call for a, declare a climate emergency. And what I wanted to do at this point right now is read an article that was published to Bloomberg News. And Bloomberg's about as mainstream uh, uh, an outfit as you're going to find. They typically focus on financial news, market news, stocks, the stock market. But they also branch into other avenues as well. Uh, they are opinion, not just opinion leaders. Uh, the media is opinion makers. The media tells people what to think, what to believe, and even at times how to feel. And the article I'm going to read is, is very much in that vein in telling people how to feel. And when you get into the issue of propaganda, feeling is very important. Feeling, driving an emotional response is, is a hallmark of propaganda. And when I read this article, I went to, I said to myself, geez, Joseph Gables would have been, would, would have been, he would have been jealous about, I think, the degree, uh, how far this article went. So without any further ado, I'm going to read the article and it's, and it's linked down below. Canada's wildfires expose the climate change, quote, spiral of silence. And this article was published on June 10, so two days ago, two and a half, two, two and a half days ago. What should you do when the air outside contains dangerous levels of pollution? Stay indoors if you can, buy an air purifier, wear a mask to travel. It's a list of precautions familiar to people in cities like Delhi, Beijing, and San Francisco where air pollution or seasonal wildfire smoke are the norm. It's a list newly familiar to millions more people across North America whose skies filled this week with dangerous smoke drifting from fires in Canada. It's a list that will become more familiar every year as climate change drives up wildfire frequency and intensity. But how should you feel? when the air outside contains dangerous levels of pollution, or your community is flooding, or drought is ravaging crop, crops. I'm going to stop right there, break away from the article, but listen to this. They're telling you, how should you feel? And then they paint scary, scary, you know, your community is flooding. Drought is ravaging crops, not just a drought. Language is important. Drought is ravaging crops. So I'm going back to the article. There's a list for that too. And this is how you are to feel. And this is a quote. So I'm going to, but how should you feel when the air outside contains dangerous levels of pollution or your community is flooding or drought is ravaging crops? There is a list for that too. Grief, terror, rage, guilt, shame, helplessness. Any and all of those reactions are understandable and worth sitting in. So wallow in your grief, terror, rage, guilt, shame, and helplessness. Sit in it. Embrace it is what this article is telling us. And they're quoting, that's according to Margaret Klein Salomon, a clinical psychologist by training and executive director of the Climate Emergency Fund. I would invite you to look at that up, that organization, Climate Emergency Fund, which funds disruptive climate activism. Salomon, author of Facing the Client Emergency, is based in Brooklyn. She spoke to Bloomberg Green on Friday as the skies over New York City started to clear. And they ask her, what sort of reactions are you seeing from people as they experience the sky turn orange and the bad air? And she says, I think like in most climate disasters, they stayed pretty focused on what was immediately unfolding. As far as I've seen, though, it's not a huge sample size. They have not yet started to think, what about the next one? What's coming down the pike? 
And then they ask, what do you think it takes to get people to the point where they are actually anxious, scared, or just feeling more? Feelings. They want, they want us, they're really hitting on this feeling thing, theme. And the response, well, I mean, that certainly is the million dollar question because this kind of event should, by all rights, trigger a kind of Pearl Harbor type response. The country was bitterly divided over going into that war, World War II, with the most popular view being isolationist. After that attack, the Pearl Harbor attack, it became abundantly clear that it wasn't a choice. Of course, they don't want to go to war, but we had to. This is the kind of reaction we need politically. So breaking away from the article, this psychologist with the Climate Emergency Fund or whatever, she is almost advocating for a declaration of war on, on climate change. Think about what that might entail politically. Then they ask, what are the sorts of things people can and are feeling about climate change and how can they start to process that? And she says, the first thing is to recognize that what you are feeling is healthy and that feeling takes courage and that as you go on this process, it's critical to treat yourself with self-compassion. The situation is so extreme that the feelings will also be extreme breaking away from the article, the ad, they're advocating, this woman is advocating right now for you, me, and everyone. They want us to feel like Gre Greta Thunberg. The, you know, uh, how dare you? And I want you to feel the, the terror and panic that I feel every day. That's what they want. That's what we are being programmed. Anyway, she goes on. The second thing, it's really critical not to be alone with your climate anxiety, terror, and grief. The number one feeling that people report to me when I ask, how do you feel about the climate emergency? They say, I feel so alone. No one understands how bad it is. My friends don't understand. My family don't understand. They feel alien alienated and separate from other people because of this knowledge and emotional experience that they have. What's so ironic about that is that we all share the same atmosphere. This is happening to all of us. So by all rights, it should be an experience that fosters emotional connection rather than separation. And it can if you talk to people about your feelings. We Feelings trump facts in today's world. I'm breaking away from the article. Feelings trump objective reality in today's world. Feelings are more important. How you feel determines what your gender is in 2023. If you feel, if I feel like a woman, then uh, somehow in today's world that bends objective reality, and I become a woman. We're told, and if you believe that, there's a remedy. Uh, and I'm going to get into that, but this is the language that they're using, and it's a path we're being led down that is absolutely, you would think that the majority of people would see through it, but we are such a, there's such a herd mentality with the population, and we've been told to value feelings to such a degree that we're, we're ignoring objective reality. So I'm going back to the article. Why do you think it is so hard? This is what they're asking this psychologist. Why do you think it is so hard to just start talking about those feelings and the crisis in general? And the response that she gives, it's emotionally overwhelming and it's difficult socially. When I talk to people about the scale of the climate emergency and what's at stake, that crops are failing, and states are going to fail, and civilizations are going to fail. I always feel guilty, among other feelings, because it's like being the bearer of such horrible news. Put away your crystal ball, doctor. You're not. You're not Nostradamus. You're not Nostradamus. You're Nostradamus. 
and then uh, it goes on. The Yale program on climate communication talks about the spiral of silence, meaning people talk about climate because uh, I'm going to read that again. The Yale program on climate communication talks about the spiral. spiral sp <laughs> I'm developing a stutter. The spiral of sci science, meaning people don't talk about climate because people don't talk about climate. The fact that people aren't talking about it makes it seem like they're not worried about it. Well, they're acting normal, so it must be fine. The implication is just by leading your normal life, you're actually contributing to mass climate denial because people are looking at you and seeing that you think things are normal. The climate activists are a critical part of how to reverse this spiral of silence and make it in into people yelling about climate change from the rooftops all the time. The activists are not acting normal. They're getting arrested 10 times and throwing soup on paintings and the extremity of their actions is also a demonstration of the depth of their feeling and fear. So it's an acting. I'm gonna break away from the article. Uh, we had a protest in Ottawa over the COVID restrictions and People were talking about their feelings about the mandates and about the vaccine passports and everything else, and their feelings didn't matter. <laughs> but now feelings matter. This is an upside-down world we're in. And then the article goes on, and this is a psychologist talking again. I want to talk about grief, climate grief. Can you, oh, sorry, they're asking her. I want to talk about grief, climate grief. Can you define what that is? What are different stages of climate grief and why it's important to go through the grieving process? And this is how the article ends. Her answer is grieving is how we acknowledge and mourn our losses and adapt to new realities. If we don't grieve, we don't get to that stage. Grief is as central Grief is central as a key part of the human condition, and it's, it's a very important process to go through. With climate grief, there's so many losses, it's overwhelming. But I think the most personal, personal and affecting element of climate grief is to grieve the future you thought you had. That is the end of the article. I'd love to see some comments. Uh, I don't know if uh, YouTube says I have one person watching it, watching right now. For all I know, that's a YouTube community standards bot, making sure that I don't cross over the line. Uh, I'm not offering advice. I'm not an expert on anything. I'm just uh, using what I consider my God-given common sense. And I'll, I'll reference something that you can easily verify uh, whenever anyone brings up the climate debate. There are a couple points I, I bring up. Firstly, I ask people, what is the percentage of carbon, the big bad boogeyman that's going to destroy the planet? What is the percentage of carbon as part of the Earth's atmosphere? You know, we have nitrogen, we have oxygen, we have all these. Hey, punk my video, glad to see you. I, I just... Uh, it's always nice to know someone's watching. Um, I ask people, what, what, what percentage of our atmosphere is carbon? And I'll get answers, 6%, 8%, 20%, 30%. And I would invite you to look up what the actual percentage is. It's less than 0.1%. It's like 0, 0.0 something percent of the Earth's atmosphere. It's not 6, it's not 20, it's not 30. It's a trace element of our atmosphere and it is going to render the planet unlivable and people wonder why the the climate i mean there's a gentleman who lives in my town jeff i'll just use his first name and he's run for the green party every election and lost every election uh, however he just recently was elected to our town council and he and I have crossed swords in a local community forum on Facebook uh, when and ever climate has come up. And he has an issue with me. And I have an issue with him. And we have, cro we have, we have crossed swords. And we actually sat down one time in a local 
coffee shop to talk. He's a nice, he's a nice gentleman. He's a nice gentleman. He has no degrees in uh, any of this, uh, in any of these science related fields. For, but he's convinced that the experts that he is listening to, and I would say he's listening to the propaganda, but the experts he's listening to are the only experts worth listening to, and everyone else is disinformation. And I, I get under his skin because I give as good as I get. Uh, I'm able to challenge him, and I don't. I'm not a. I'm not a shirking violet. I'll and what and the uh, and I'll bring up points like the fact that in 950 A.D. or Common Era, some people prefer that that um, designation. For the year AD Anno Domini, year of our Lord CE Common Era, in 950, the ice sheets on Greenland, Greenland rolled back to such a significant degree. They they rolled right back that when the Vikings went sailing by, they called it Greenland because that is what it was, a green land, and it was so green, so lush, and so inviting that they established settlements there. And this was during a period that is referred to as the medieval warming period. Yes, there was climate, climate change happened in 950 AD. And people talk about the ice sheets on Greenland rolling back. Well, look what they did in 950 AD. They rolled back so far that the Vikings established permanent settlements and those settlements thrived for between two and 300 years. And the rhetorical tongue in cheek question I ask is, was it be, did, did this happen because the Vikings were using pl plastic bags? Were they measuring their carbon footprint? Did they have too many farting cows spewing methane into the atmosphere? What caused the climate change? And did they stop using plastic bags uh, after uh, after about 250, 300 years, because around the year 300 AD CE, those settlements had to be abandoned because this cyclical period of climate change did, and we entered a period referred to as the Little Ice Age. The Little Ice Age started sometime around the year 1300, and it continued right into the 1700s, and some climatologists claim that it uh, continued right into the very early 1800s. And there were catastrophic weather events during this little ice age. There were hailstorms that killed any living creature that was uncovered, cattle or human, animal or human, any animal, any creature that was uh, not in some form of shelter. The hail was so severe it killed them. And back then, back in that era, they thought it was man-made. The, the, they accused primarily women of consorting with the devil, and they had a term for it, weather cooking. You're cooking up this weather because, and the reason was because these were climactic events that were unprecedented in anyone's lifetime. When you're dealing with climatic cycles that can last three, four hundred years, five hundred years, you're going to have events that n extend beyond living memory. We've never seen wildfires like this before. I bet you there have been wildfires like this before, before colonization, before Europeans arrived in North America. If you're, if you're only looking back 100 or so years, you know, it's like the, we'll hear that uh, Lake Ontario water levels at the low are at their lowest levels since recording began in 1950 or something like that. It's like you've got a lake that's 10,000 years old, give or take, who knows. And now you're looking at a sample side, size of 70, 80 years. That's like judging how your day is going to go based on the first 20 seconds after you wake up. It's ridiculous. 
However, that's the world we live in. So continuing on, uh, read the Bloomberg article, we're being programmed to be afraid. And what I'm going to suggest is that this agenda, this is tied in to everything we went through during the COVID era. And the COVID era really hasn't ended. It's just kind of gone to sleep for a little bit. I mean, it's still there. I still see people walking around wearing masks with looks of fear in their eyes because they've got to go grocery shopping or whatever. And, oh, my gosh, I've got to be out around people. And there are germs. And this mask probably is useless, but I've got to have something. That's what I, that's the internal monologue I imagine these people having. All I simply do is smile as, and be as friendly as I can and ask them, how are you doing today? It's, yeah, I'm going to be happy. <laughs> I'm not going to confirm their fear. Uh, but the, the bottom line is fear is the prime, fear was used during COVID I just read that Bloomberg article. Fear is being driven now. And even though the, the these fires have subsided, we're very early in, this is late spring. It's not even summer yet. When I made my prediction on April 30th that we'd have a climate emergency, uh, I said for the summer of 2023. We haven't even hit the summer yet. What are, we're the 13th now. We've rolled into Tuesday. And uh, so we're eight days, still over a week away from the start of summer. Summer still hasn't arrived yet. Summer's coming. And then all we need is a two, three week period, maybe a month long where there isn't any rain. And then this can blow up again. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm firm in my prediction that we'll have a climate emergency declared. And it may not even be wildfire related. When I did my vid video April 30th, all I said was there will need to be, I believe, a catalyst, something to, you know, get everyone focused on. Like when it was COVID, they focused on Italy and China. And I think Iran, or, 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 or Iran, Iran to a degree. Uh, so now we've had the, the fires. I think it's, there's potential that there could be other, uh, whether it's flooding, whether it's uh, uh, tornadoes or, or other storms or anything, they're going to blame it on climate change, whether it's a naturally occurring event or something that I think uh, is manufactured. And I lean heavily toward believing something will be manufactured. If something organically happens, they'll latch onto it, though. It's almost impossible to tell what's real and what's been manufactured. Uh, but fear is such a key element. And I wanted to lean on my faith, my Christian faith. Even non-Christians will be familiar with the 23rd Psalm. Not all, but I think even people who have, haven't picked up a Bible have heard the words of the 23rd Psalm, and I'm going to invite you to read it with me and to let the words wash over you. Uh, leaving faith aside, it's a well-known, well-established psychological fact that fear robs a person of their capacity to think critically, to reason, to question, to be skeptical. All these things go away and I'll call it our animalistic brain. You know, you have the, the frontal lobes where your higher thought processes exist, where they take place. Well, they shut down when people are afraid. And we, we resort, you know, fight or flight. Oh, my God. And getting back, I would read over that article again. The psychologist who knows this, anyone with a degree in psychology will know this, that fear robs a person of their ability to act in a sane, rational manner, to question, to be skeptical, and to think critically. And there's a reason the Bible, the words fear not, appear in scripture 365 times. And there's a reason for that. God did not intend for us to live in a spirit of fear because God knows what fear is does to us. So again, I'll invite you to read with me. I've, I've cut and paste 
the King James version of the 23rd Psalm. And it doesn't matter to me whether you know, New Living Translation, Revised Standard, there are dozens of translations available. I haven't read all the varying translations, and I'm not particularly fond of the King James Version, but there are certain passages of Scripture, like the 23rd Psalm, which have been are so well known that the words have a greater weight for me. They have more significance and more meaning. So what I'm going to invite you to do is read with me. Just scroll down, read the words with me, whether you're watching now, bunk my video, or uh, if you're watching, if someone's watching this later, who knows how many people will watch this, all, all three of you, but here it is, the 23rd Psalm. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of, in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Punk my video is saying the entity my friend and I saw back in 1985 seemed to feed in our fear. Fear is the language of God's enemy, of the adversary, of Satan. Uh, lots of different names, but fear, again, the Bible, 365 times you will see the words fear not. If God said it that many times, there's a message there. We are not to live in a spirit of fear. And what I'm going to tell you right now is it's coming. A climate emergency declaration, a war on climate change. Um, we have the World Health Organization now, which is updating its 2005 international health regulations. You can look this up. And they're updating those regulations. And what they are giving themselves is new powers to introduce binding measures. And it doesn't have to be something like a virus anymore or something directly related to physical health. Now, the World Health Organization can declare a health emergency over any number of things, one of which could be climate change. They could declare climate change a health emergency. And the new powers that they are granting themselves will enable them, empower them to introduce binding me measures. Whereas the 2005 international health uh, regulations were non-binding. And that meant, you'll recall that when the mandates came in, Countries like Canada and much of the Western world said we're following world health direction. We're following world, the direction of world health. We heard that repeatedly. As per world health recommendations, we're doing this. However, most will remember that one country, one country did not heed that advice, and that was Sweden. Sweden World Health was advising shutting down everything. And Sweden said, you know what? We're going to keep our elementary schools open. We're going to keep restaurants and bars open. We'll require patrons to be seated, but we're going to keep them open. We're going to limit outdoor gatherings to 50. And everyone said, oh, my God, Sweden's going to be a disaster zone. People are going to be falling dead in the streets. And... 
Sweden didn't know better or worse than anyone else. <laughs> you know, those who were all in favor of the lockdowns and everything would say, look, at they, they did worse than Denmark. And those who, like me, would say, well, yeah, well, look at Belgium. You know, statistics. One of Gate, Bill Gates, and you can check this out. One of Bill Gates' recommended books is How to Lie with Statistics. There are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. You can manipulate numbers in any number of ways. And typically what will happen is people will, if they're afraid of climate change, they'll latch on to any statistics presented which confirm their fear. And anything that doesn't confirm their fear will get thrown in the garbage and will be labeled misinformation. So the last two things, I have two things to wrap up with. Number one, those inclined to protest this, like we saw with rallies and freedom marches and stuff like that. Uh, you know, we had, um, oh, I forget what the rallies were called. Wake up Canada, whatever. They were in Toronto. They were all over Canada, all over the world. They came about after the mandates. They came out after March. People started protesting. What I'm going to suggest is that if, and goodness knows, probably no one of that sort will see my little pathetic, miserable video. But if you're an individual who was tied into these rallies and these, these movements, and you have the capacity to organize these type of events, you need to do it now. <laughs> you need to do it soon. You need to do it before an emergency is declared, before a war on climate change is declared, because the power of the media and government do not underestimate it. There's a tendency to believe that, oh, they'll never try it again, that we, we beat it back. And I'm here to tell you this World Economic Forum, Fourth Industrial Revolution, as I like to call it, the Fourth, fourth Reich, when this Great Reset and this UN Agenda 2030 and the Sustainable Development Goals and all this, that train has not been stopped. It is still coming at us. I think a lot of people realize this. But the media and the, 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 even the, the digital media, the Twitters, the Reddits, the Facebooks, tele, even Telegram and Parler, even when you think, oh, we've got our safe little community. No, you don't. Technology has advanced to such a degree that the architects of this agenda are able to create the digital illusion of a popular narrative. That's how they've sold this LGBTQ XYZ P agenda, is they've created this impression that a lot of people buy into, and they think, well, I'm going to be quiet, because it seems to be that's the way the world is going, and I, I, you know, I, I want to be part of the herd. I want to, I want to be swimming with the current. I don't want to go against the current. I don't want to get run over. So people go along because there's this impression they can flood social media. I mean, now we have, you know, you have bots, you have algorithms. Now we have this artificial intelligence and they can create the illusion of a narrative. And, but where the rubber hits the road and where we see that it's garbage is the Bud Light puts this guy on their, um, on their beer, on their Bud Light beer. So I guess that's Interbrew puts this guy on there, this guy who likes to dress up like a girl on their beer cans and their sales plummet because 
your purchasing behavior isn't a public statement. You go into the beer store or liquor, or you go into where, however you buy your beer in Ontario, Ontario, where I live, you have to go to the beer store. But you know, no one's watching. No one cares what brand you buy, as long as you buy some. <clears throat> and people could more or less silently tap out of this LGBTQ XLMNOP, you know. 2s whatever we tapped out same thing we've seen with target their market capitalization and their sales have plummeted people are realize the degree of garbage that this is but because of a digital illusion about popular and and those who are in on this those who are in on this you know the activists who this woman in this Bloomberg article for the climate side, she's encouraging the activists, you know, she's encouraging them to go to jump the shark and go crazy. <laughs> and people fear crazy people. I mean, when you saw that protest in Ottawa, it wasn't a bunch of crazies. It was people with bouncy castles and hot tubs and Mothers go walking around in circles with their kids and holding hands and to the song, We Are the World. You know, these were the sanest, happiest, most pleasant people in the world. And yet the media programmed a lot of people to be afraid of it. Hong Kong, they're terrorizing Ottawa residents with peace, love, bouncy castles, and hot tubs. But... Some were afraid to question the narrative. Too many. And so what I'm saying is get out in front of it. If you're going to organize a protest, don't wait until a climate emergency is declared for a war on climate change to be declared. Protest now because it is coming. There is a first mover advantage. Move first. I'm not that way inclined. I'm not that dialed in. I live in a small little town. I have had a thought to trying to organize something locally in my little town of 12,000 people. Um, and I may yet still do it, but uh, it's something that we need to do. We need to protest it ahead of time and be proactive instead of reactive. And the last thing, there is an awakening. People talk about this, and it is there. Uh, I, you know, I mentioned it many times. I'm ex-military, refused the you-know-what, and left the military in June of 2021. And then in May of 2022, last year, I started working in a retail environment. I don't like to mention the name of my employer for obvious reasons. Um, at any rate, uh, I talk with people every day. Uh, I'm not shy about doing a YouTube video. I'm not shy about engaging in converse, conversation with random people. And I'm not shy about expressing my opinions vis-a-vis -vis Great Reset, climate change, COVID, the, you know, jabs, anything. And I... I'm pleasantly surprised at the number of people who I had a conversation just like this today as I was leaving. Uh, I engaged a gentleman in conversation, and uh, it quickly became apparent. Uh, we talked a bit about the weather, and I said, man, I bet you there's going to be a climate emergency declared. And he goes, oh, for sure. He goes, it's all part of the game. And, and I went, great reset. He goes, oh, yeah, I know all about it. I said, lots of, and he said, lots of people do. The only thing is we need to talk. We can't be shy. And if you're bold, be bolder. And if you're shy, get over your shyness. And unfortunately, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm not a big one on sharing my U YouTube videos. As someone will say, well, who, who's this Joe Schmo nobody on YouTube? And that's what I am. I'm a Joe Schmo nobody. But you're not. And when we talk in person, face to face with people we know, when there's flesh and bone meeting flesh and bone, things become real. And that's the end of my that's the end of my message. So it is coming. 
There is going to be a climate emergency declared. My crystal ball won't tell me when. I'm just saying it's coming this summer. And I actually expect that there will be some more, I don't know if catalytic is the right word, but there will be more catalysts, maybe more wildfires, maybe it'll be tornadoes, maybe it'll be other significant weather events. And I'm convinced if something doesn't happen organically, that something will be manufactured and then, and that's why I say it's coming. And if you're inclined to protest it, do it now before that declaration. Be proactive, not reactive. So anyway, uh, punk my video. Thank you. Uh, I don't know what you're talking about when you say that you saw an entity in 1985 and how it fed on your fear. Uh, but, uh, fear is the weapon of the enemy and, uh, I, I guess I should wrap this up with one final thing. And this is what I tend to do. And I apologize. I go to church pretty much every Sunday and pastors are famous for doing this. They say, well, in summary, and you can sense in the congregation, a lot of, oh, thank goodness, and, you know, the sermon's finally over. And then they go on for another five, ten minutes, and then they say, now to wrap things up. Oh, come on. And they'll do that two, two or three times. Guilty as charged. Um, but it's about faith. And if you think that this life is all there is, you're not seeing the full picture. Punk my video it looked like the Grim Reaper. It had glowing eyes and it came out of a vortex in a hillside. I never had an experience like that myself. I will tell you about an experience I did have when I was in first year university living in residence. Something I'm not proud of, um, but it's fact. I mean, it's after a night of partying and of drinking heavy drinking, and passing the duchy, to use a tired old expression, um, a little bit of Mary Jane, uh, someone brought out a Ouija board. And it didn't work when most of us touched it, but there were two characters, Peter and Mike, roommates. And Peter and Mike, when either one of them had their hands on it, then we would be in contact with whatever. But if it was myself and my roommate, Marshall, or any other two people, wouldn't didn't work. If Peter was touching it or Mike was touching it, it moved. And when the two of them were together, it really moved. And I'm, I was skeptical. Like, I'm like, yeah, you, you guys are manipulating it. And they're like, no, man, no, this is real. I'm not doing this. I'm not sure. And so I decided to test it. And so I asked it a question. And a question to which no one in the room knew the answer because I hadn't spoken to anyone about this. And to add a further element to it, I asked the question in French. And I said, Donne-moi le nom de mon oncle, mon oncle qui est décidé. Give me the name of my dead uncle. I only have one. I only had, I now have more, but at that point I only had one dead uncle. And it started writing out A L E X A and Alexander. Yes. That was freaky because that was the name of my uncle. And so then I asked, En quel pays est-ce qu'il était tué? Which means, in what country was it was he killed? And the pointer went K-O-R, and someone said Korea, and it swung down to yes. Now I'm freaked. The next thing that happened was the pointer then spelled out G-E-T-O-U-T-G-O-D-L-O-V-E-R. Get out, God lover. 
And someone, might have been Peter or Mike or someone else in the room, said, who is the God lover? And it's spelled G-O-R-D-O, -O, Gordon, yes. And then it's spelled out again, get out, God lover. And it kept repeating that until the pointer flew off the table and embedded itself in the wall. Freaky, freaky, freaky story. Uh, I wasn't walking a Christian path at that point. And yet, but the summer I was turning 16, I had invited Jesus Christ into my heart as Lord, Lord and Savior. And then it was a couple years after that, that I turned my back on Christ. Conscious decision. I wanted lordship of my own life. I wanted to taste all the fruits. I had a good grounding. I, you know, I didn't need anyone having lordship over my life. I didn't need God's loving hand. The, the story of the apple, or not apple, but the fruit, the fruit of the tree of good knowledge, that's an ongoing story. That's almost, it's allegorical. It's something that it, it, we all go through. And we want, we want, we want to decide for ourselves what is good or, good or evil, what is right and wrong. We want to make bargains. We want to bend the fabric of reality. And when you do that, trouble comes. And anyway, uh, so the point I'm trying to get at is this life is not the end. We are not the authors of life and the end is not the end. What we think, what we see, this earthly existence is not the end. There is more to come. We are not home. This is not our home. And um, that is freeing when you read the words of the 23rd Psalm. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's home. Anyway, EXA. All right. Well, again, exactly. Thank you, Punk My Video. And again, thank you for watching. Whether you're watching now, whether you watch later, if you want to like, share, subscribe, do all anything you like. This channel is not monetized. I'm getting zero. It's not why I do it. Uh, just do it to share and for my own benefit because it helps me work through m what I'm thinking. Call it catharsis if you like. Anyway, God bless. And I think it's about time I get to bed. Good night all.